So, all right, the Bibles go ahead and open to the first chapter of, of Ephesians. Do you ever wonder if you're saved? When I was younger, I always, I always wondered, how do we know we're saved? My grandma once asked me, Ned, and she asked me because I'm gay. She asked me, how do you know that you're going to heaven? And it's an important question. And sometimes you read the Bible and wonder, is Paul trying to tell me I'm saved or is he trying to tell me I, I can't know for sure? I'm not really sure where he's going with this. But I told my grandma the same thing I'll tell you, that I don't think God expects us to get everything right. I don't think he expects us to read this 2,000-year-old book written in another language and expect to get every point of theology perfect. I don't think we're being judged on those criteria. I think we're being judged more on the participation trophy criteria. Jesus said, if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be opened. And that means that as long as we're seeking God, we know we're saved. And in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is speaking very plainly. He's speaking very bluntly. And I love Paul's books because every one of them, he writes to a different audience. And he writes very differently. This book has language that doesn't appear in any of Paul's other writings. And especially the way he talks about salvation is different here than anywhere else. John Calvin, when he read this, hung his entire theology about predestination on this passage. I think it's a rather interesting passage to hang a theology on when it's very different from everything else. Starting in verse 3, it says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Now, so far, this opening is, very, is a very mystical opening. And it makes sense. He's talking to Greeks, and they love their mysticism. They love hidden knowledge. They love wisdom. That's what Greeks are looking for. And so... Paul isn't going to quote the scripture to them to establish authority. He's going to talk about mysticism because that's what they're into. That's what they consider spiritual authority to come from. Not the scripture like we do today or like Jews would back then. But authority comes from God himself and it comes from revelation. So Paul opens with that. He opens that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ, that he understands these realms, and that's why you should listen to him. So now that he has the Greek's interest, for he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And already we're getting into that predestination language. Before the foundation of the world, he goes on, he did this by predestining us to adoption. And before you think of predestination, of fate, of we have no choices, everything is destiny and fate, and God made all of our choices for us, I want you to think of this. <clears throat> How strange a phrase is predestining to adoption. Who in this world is ever predestined to adoption? It's a, it's a weird phrase in English, and it's an even weirder phrase in Greek. Because this word in Greek means before the boundary. And every translator, every translator of the Bible says, well, it's before the boundary. And before this, he said the foundation of the world. So clearly he's referring to that. It's still a weird phrase. And he uses it again. Even weirder is that he says he did this by. 
we never get clear cut visions of what is going on in the spiritual world beyond what we can perceive. We never get, he did this, then he did this, then he did this, then he did this. If you turn to Genesis chapter one, you will even see that it's highly um, metaphorical language and the language is figurative and poetic. Even there where we get day one, day two, day three, day four, it's highly figurative, but Paul goes right to the literal. Why? Like I said, every church he's written to, he writes very differently. He's writing based on where they're coming from. And I think this tells us a lot about the Ephesians perspective more than it does Paul's theology. Because he says, he did this by predestining us to adoption as his legal heirs through Christ Jesus. Well, now we're getting into some technical, legal, you know, um, inheritance language. So this tells us what kind of church the, makes up the Ephesian church. You know, what kind of people make up the Ephesian church? These are highly technical, practical people. They still look to all that mystical, spiritual stuff for authority, like other Greeks do. But these are probably tradespeople. These are probably, they might be bankers, they might be, uh, they might be lawyers, they might be, who knows, but they're practical people. They're not artists, they're not, uh, you know, they're not priests, they're not, they're not creative people that really lean towards the mystical side of things. And so he says, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace that he freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved son. So everything that we experience, everything about how we come to God comes through the son. And this is what he's telling the Ephesians. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our offenses, according to the riches of his grace, that he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He did this when, once again, we have spiritual things being talked about in practical ways. He did this when he revealed to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. So once again, Paul is appealing to revelation, to mysteries, because when did God reveal his will to us? The whole Bible hasn't been written yet. We could say, well, he did it in the Bible. It hasn't been written yet. How about the Old Testament? Paul's still writing the New Testament. <laughs> and, he's, and he's not appealing to the Old Testament at all, you notice. He is appealing only to the gospel, which tells us that the revelation was in the gospel. This is how we learned of Christ. This is how we learned of what God wants in our lives. What did Christ do for us? Not only in his death, not only in his resurrection, but in his life. What did he do for us? How did he change his life? How did he change our lives? That is what the good pleasure of God is. He says, toward the administration of the fullness of the times. Paul thinks he's living in the last days. At least that's the idea that we get. And it might be that Paul thinks he's living in the most important days in history. Not necessarily that the world is coming to an end in, you know, 65 AD. That there's a countdown timer, a doomsday clock going. But he thinks he... But he says, in the fullness of the times. That means that the times are complete. There's something that is coming to its completion. To head up all things in Christ, the things in heaven and the things on earth. In Christ, we too have been claimed as God's own possession. There's that inheritance language again. Since we were predestined 
according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. And when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in Christ, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Now, why do I say that this isn't John Calvin's idea of predestination? Because of right here. When you believed in Christ, when you were marked, you received the Holy Spirit. That's a choice. And that kills predestination right there. If we can make a choice, then that's not destiny. That's not fate. That's God reaching out to us and us choosing to take his hand. Us choosing Yes, Lord, I will let you change my life. I will accept the Holy Spirit, and I will be led by your presence. And he says, to the praise, of, oh, excuse me, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of our inheritance. Once again, relating the spiritual to the very, very practical. The down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. In other words, God is giving us his spirit as a down payment. And that is utterly practical. You know what a down payment is, that you get to hold on to it until God fulfills all of his promises to you. And I wonder, I wonder how long that is. We see in Revelation that there are the martyrs who cry out to the Lord day and night to be vindicated. How long does it take for God to honor his promises to them? And what are God's promises to each and every one of us? He goes on, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you when I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, will give you spiritual wisdom and revelation in your growing knowledge of him. They're still growing as Christians. They're looking to Revelation because they don't know the scriptures. They're looking to the gospel because they don't know all of God's promises yet. They're still learning. They're still growing. And that is one of God's promises to us. We have the spirit. He is with us and he will guide us and lead us and love us all of our days. He goes on, since the eyes of your heart have been enlightened so that you can know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the incomparable greatness of his power towards us who believe as displayed in the exercise of his immense strength. All they know is the gospel. So when he talks about that exercise of God's great strength, it is the resurrection of Christ. Because the Greeks believe, at least they believe, that no God was greater than nature. That there is an order to the world and no God can supersede that order. So when Christ rose from the grave, when he broke that order, it was by the power of the one and only God who could perform miracles in this world. In the first century, even after Paul had written all of his letters, Christians were berated by the Roman and Greek pagans and by Greek philosophers who wrote of their right triangles and their mathematics and said that it's silly 
to say that Moses could part the Red Sea. It's silly to think of manna in the wilderness. It's silly to think of water that turns to wine because, as they would say, our gods do sensible things, you know, like cheating on their wives and uh, lopping off bits of themselves and having petty conflicts, sensible things. But their God just breaks all the rules. And they lament that their gods can't do those things. But of course, the Greeks were unbelievers, right? They didn't. Oh, they believed in they, something. They, yeah, but I mean, in their own, mm -hmm. their own but, religion. But they believed that nothing was greater than nature. Yeah. And they mocked the miracles. And they mocked our religion because we let women and children and the uneducated and the poor speak and sit in the front row in the pews and eat with us. We would share a meal with the poor. Can you imagine? That's the world that Paul was preaching to. That is the power of God. That is the breaking of the order of nature. And when he's talking about inheritance, he is talking about a God who blessed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the youngest sons. He blessed them. The natural order is that the oldest son inherits everything. That's natural. But God worked miracles through the youngest son, generation after generation, because God doesn't really care what nature has to say. He's going to work his will regardless. So when Paul talks about predestination, he's not saying we have no choices. He's not saying that God has made all the decisions in life, but he is saying that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Not life, not the powers of this world, not the Greek gods, not Satan and his demons, and certainly not death. And that is the hope that we have in Christ. As we study the scriptures, we grow in the knowledge of our God, not because we have to. We already have the gospel. We already believe and have been baptized and are saved. We do so because we want to know what God's will is in this world. Because we believe in him, because we love him and he loves us. And we want to see his will in this world. Because if we are the children of God, if miracles are going to come into this world, it's going to have to be through us. And if we cease speaking the truth, if we speak, if we, if we cease following the Lord, then just like Jesus said, the rocks will cry out in our place. When we start seeing miracles elsewhere, oh boy, do you know we were, we're in trouble. <laughs> but that is who Paul is appealing to because the Greeks look for spiritual authority. They look for mysteries. They look for signs. And Paul says, this is why you came to this God because he performs miracles that you haven't seen anywhere else, that you can't see anywhere else, that your old gods said were impossible. And so that's the hope that we have. There is, not, there is no life or death. There is no power in this world that keeps us from the love of God. And it is as certain as when Paul says, he did this at the foundation of the world. He did this when he rose from the grave. That is how certain these things are. So with that, let's pray. Father, we thank you that this world we live in is wonderfully made that, it, that everything that you have made points to you, Lord. That you have set the stars in the sky. That you have placed the creatures on the land and in the sky and in the sea. That everything that moves and has breath 
shines the light of your, well, proves your existence, Lord. Lord, we pray that we look for you in the word, that we embody you in our actions. Lord, we pray that we shine your light in this world and that people know that there is a God who still performs miracles this day, that there is still a God who saves and that there is still a God who loves. And who is calling each and every one of us home. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Sorry.